Hello and welcome to the Byzantine Scotist. This is part two in the series of videos on Scotism. If you haven't seen the first part of this series, The Proof for the Existence of God, you'll want to watch that one before watching this video, because this one will pick up with the argumentation where that left off, now looking at the divine attributes. So before we move on to part two here, I want to look back at what we discussed in the first video. So we first talked about metaphysical efficient causality. So we have a first being that necessarily exists as the cause of existence itself, not merely motion. Then we went on from there to discuss the possibility of it, that even if the universe didn't exist, there would still need to be a cause of the possibility of the existence of the universe, and therefore there would still need to be a first principle. From here, we're going to continue on in this video to discuss the divine attributes that flow out from this. So we have a triple primacy of causality first, which is how God relates to the world. These are the relative attributes of God. So we have efficient causality, final causality, and eminence. And he, needs, he also wants to show that all of these inhere, inhere in a single first principle. And this is his stepping point from these triple primacy to the discussion of the absolute properties of the first principle. From there, he'll go on to discuss the absolute properties of the first principle, which will really be the bulk of this video of intellect, will, simplicity, omnipotence, omniscience, foreknowledge, infinity, all these important attributes. But this will ground our future discussions, especially our discussion of the property of infinity. God's infinity is the ultimate thing that Scotus really wants to get at as a definition of God, um, drawing here on Bonaventure and then also on the patristic uh, tradition. And so I'm going to talk about Scotus's arguments here for infinity, but really there will be another video in this series following this one on univocity and infinity because that's very central uh, to Scotus's conception of God, and there needs to really be a lot of work to show what he means by that. So we're only going to touch on it a little bit here. And then finally, Scotus will say, well, now we can call this being God, because before this, we only have a first principle, but we don't necessarily have God as it would be defined in the Christian tradition. We don't have this personal God. And really, once he introduces intellect and will, then he'll say, he'll start calling it God. But he really wants to say we need all of this to say it's God, not merely some first principle. So now that Scotus has shown that there must be some first principle, he wants to begin to look at the attributes of this first principle, but he doesn't want to move to the stronger attributes he's going to talk about later. He doesn't talk about these as absolute attributes, but they're really only attributes God has in reference to the actual existence of the world. And each of these could be formulated in another way to prove the existence of God all on their own. But Scotus thinks they work a little bit better if we put them more as we begin to talk about God's attributes than as absolute proofs for the existence of God, just because they're a little bit harder to grasp. And so the first one he's going to give is a primacy of final causality. And so we can essentially go, this is directly from Scotus number 68, Every, premise one, every efficient cause per se acts for an end. Premise two, a prior efficient cause for a prior end. Premise three, therefore, the first efficient cause acts for the ultimate end. Premise four, but it acts principally and ultimately for nothing other than itself. Premise five, therefore, it acts for itself as for an end. Premise six, therefore, the first efficient cause is the first end. What he's essentially saying is that every time someone makes an action, it's for some particular end, right? That God is freely causing the existence of the universe, and so there must be some reason that he's doing it for. Now, every prior efficient cause acts for a prior end. What is he saying here? He's essentially saying that as you go further up in the series of per se efficient causality, it acts further in the end. So what exactly does that mean, right? So if I am right, holding a stick to push a rock, to push a root, to pull up the dirt, 
I'm doing this right if I want to if let's say I want to pull up the dirt that's my goal and I do this whole series of steps to cause it I'm thinking of that ultimate end as my goal and so actually the further back we go in efficient causality the further forward we can go in final causality and this is actually thought of as prior in classical philosophy I know that's a little hard to grasp if you've never read Aristotle before or you've never read any classical philosophers before but if you've read them um, this will be very clear what I'm saying I'm probably not phrasing it the clearest unfortunately I think since we threw out final causality in modern philosophy it can be a little hard for modern people to grasp what's being said if you want to look for a more detailed version of this argument it's in book 12 of Aristotle's metaphysics where he lays it out in quite a good detail and it's very well argued uh, so then we have therefore the first efficient cause acts for the ultimate end right, so it's actually a little bit different than Aristotle in some ways because Aristotle wants to say everything is moving towards God but Scotus wants to say well if everything's moving towards God God must have caused it in the first place to move towards it it must have given it that efficient causality this is really coming again out of Avicenna and so right, God intentionally acts for this end and that's what moves all things towards this end this is where we get in premise four it acts principally and ultimately for nothing other than itself right that God has to act for the highest end because God is the highest and so God has to act towards himself and so the reason God creates the world is ultimately back towards himself uh, therefore it acts for itself as an end and therefore the first efficient cause is the first end that right if God acts forwards he must act towards an ultimate end because he's bringing all things into existence out of nothing right even if let's say I'm trying to push the root and not the dirt and I end up accidentally ripping up the dirt well God can't do that because God is causing everything to exist in the first place and so God can do nothing accidentally in the modern sense of that word not in the metaphysical sense of accidentally there God does all things intentionally if there's any evil in the world of course that's then the result of human free will because God does not intentionally cause evil and so the first efficient cause must be the first end so Aristotle yes he does give us walking all the way towards God as the first end but Scotus wants to sort of take a step back from Aristotle and say the reason God is the first end is because he's also the first efficient cause so the third primacy that Scotus wants to argue for is a primacy of eminence I think it's in the uh, De Primo that Scotus quotes St. Paul where he talks about Christ as the one by whom in whom and through and for whom all things were made I'm sorry Christ is God so God made everything everything was made for him but it was also in him that God is the exemplary cause of all things so the essential argument that Scotus lays out for this proof of eminence that God is most perfect and perfect beyond all things is premise one the first efficient cause is not a univocal cause with other effective natures but is an equivocal cause now this is not saying that there's not a university of being rather he's saying that it's not a cause in the same sense right so when we cause things to exist we don't cause them to come into existence out of nothing but God truly causes things to come into existence out of nothing so premise two therefore it is more eminent and more noble than they so I first want to bring up what I already quoted from Scotus the second difference is that in a per se ordered causes there is a causality of a second nature in a second order because the superior cause is more perfect and he likewise elaborates on this again in the next point within this discussion of the primacy of eminence where he says no being from another is its being from its cause nobler than is the being from something necessary of itself because every cause thing has dependent being but what is from itself has independent being so this is the sense in which it's univocal versus equivocal God has independent being and all created things have dependent being and so they're not at all the same type of being now there is a sense in which they're univocal which I'll discuss later on but in this sense of causality they are equivocal
And so therefore, God has an entirely higher order of causality than any created thing, because nothing causes him, he causes all things to come in out of nothing, and all of our, even per accidens causalities and per se causalities rely primarily upon the per se causality of God to cause the universe to come into existence. And therefore, his conclusion is the first efficient cause is most eminent. Because if God is causing all things to come in out of nothing, he is the ultimate per se cause of everything. He must likewise be most perfect and most eminent. In this next step, then, of Scotus's proof, he wants to show that these three different forms of primacy must all ultimately be from the same singular first principle and that there can't be a bunch of other first principles that have these to lesser degrees or also have them to the same degree. And he's going to use each of these different forms of primacy to prove that this has to be the case. So when it comes to a primacy of eminence, Primacy of eminence has to do with that God is most perfect. And so we have to then ask, if there were two most eminent first principles, how would we distinguish the two? The way one thing would have to be distinguished from another is that one would have to be more perfect than the other, or that they possess two different perfections, but then they would cease to actually be most eminent. If something has every possible perfection, it could not be distinguished in any other way from a principle that also has every single perfection. Now, Scotus does go in his theology of creation and talk about this idea of hykeity, that each thing has a thisness that distinguishes it. But ultimately, things only have hykeity because there's a first principle willing their hykeity. And so when we're talking about the divine, we can't bring in hykeity here because there would have to be some cause of the hykeity. And so we can't talk about one first principle having a distinction, which another first principle does not, because it would cease to be the most eminent first principle. Likewise, with efficient causality, we can discuss order. So in a per se series of causes, there must ultimately be one cause of the whole series, right? One thing imparts the causality to it, even if something else imparts causality. One of them has to be ordered under the other. And so this is the one Scotus is probably the least clear on, because he appeals here to Aristotle. And so it can be a little hard to wrap your mind around it if you're not seeing all the details which Scotus is laying out here in his mind, which he doesn't explicitly lay out here. But the essential idea here is that there has to be, one principle would have to be ordered to the other if it was the primacy of efficient causality. And so the finally, likewise, of the ultimate end, a final causality, right? There ha each thing can only have one ultimate end. One thing would have to be ordered to another thing. So right, if God is the ultimate end, something else would have to be ordered to God. And so if there were two first principles, one first principle would have to be ordered to the other. And so that one that it's ordered to, that would be the real first principle. And so that's why ultimately there can only be a singular principle that has ultimate eminence, efficient causality, and final causality. And of course, he will later bring in relation as a way to distinguish the three persons of the Trinity. But all three persons are this singular first principle. The next video in this series will be on the Trinity, and so I'll talk about that there. From here, he moves on to the absolute properties of the first principle. And the most important uh, properties he starts off with are intellect and will, because it's intellect and will that makes the first principle personal. And this is where we can begin to call it God, that Scotus isn't content merely to argue for some sort of metaphysical first principle that's not personal, because we see in Revelation that God revealed himself as a personal God. And so arguing for a personal God is very essential to Scotus. When you see the founding of the Franciscan order, uh, St. Francis isn't opposed to academic teaching. He encourages St. Anthony of Padua 
to do academic teaching. But what he tells St. Anthony is don't let it destroy the fire of devotion towards God, because when we're doing this academic work, it should all be ordered towards love of God. And that's really what Scotus's theology is in philosophy is all ordered towards, is love of God. And so he's not content to merely argue a philosophical point that a pagan could argue about some sort of first principle that's impersonal. He doesn't want to argue for the one, but the one who says, I am who I am. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as I showed in the prayer that we discussed in part one. And he brings up a three arguments that all sort of build on each other for the intellect and will of the first principle. So he first argues that nature acts for an end and only because it is dependent and directed to the end by a knower. Right, so when we make a decision towards something, there has to be the intellect there to think about it in order to make a decision. Now, Scotus doesn't adopt the intellectualist psychology of St. Thomas. I'm going to do a whole video on the psychology of Scotus, but he very much emphasizes the freedom of the will, what's frequently called voluntarism. That And I'm going to discuss this in more detail. Scotus's voluntarism is not an arbitrary voluntarism, as is often argued from Occam. I haven't read enough Occam, so I don't know if that's actually a fair representation of Occam. But it's often how voluntarism, when the word is said, is thought of. It's its arbitrary movement of the will. But what Scotus is pointing out here is, no, nature acts for an end because it's dependent and directed to the end by a knower. So there has to be the intellect which knows something and presents that information to the will, that the will can truly make a free choice based on the information, because if the will isn't properly informed, it isn't going to be able to make that information truly freely because it's not going to have all the evidence to be able to know the right decision that it wants to move towards. And the will is part of the mind, it is rational, but it has to have that information presented to it by the intellect. And there's two parts of the intellect as um, St. Bonaventure goes into, but I'll discuss all that in a future video. And so the first agent itself acts for an end is the next part of his argument. So when God, this is what we argued for with final causality, is that when God creates the world and eternally causes its existence, he does so for an end, which we showed is himself. And so the, intel the first principle then has to have intellect and will, because it has to be able to know what it wants to do and then act towards that end freely. Mm -hmm. This is what he really emphasizes with the third argument, which is some effect is when caused, contingently caused. Because what we showed in part one is that the universe is contingent because it could possibly not be or it could be some other way as can be shown by reason and so the universe then is contingently caused it doesn't necessarily exist and so god freely causes its existence out of love and this shows the act of the will and that the will must truly be free to make multiple decisions the universe isn't really contingent unless it's free to choose. And this is what Scotus is getting at here. The first principle freely wills the existence of creation. And so this is one of the advantages we have from going from this argument from efficient causality, because the contingency of the universe and the relationship between intellect and will, if we reflect on our own minds, shows that this first principle has to have intellect and will. So the next step Scotus makes is to argue for the divine simplicity of the first principle. And the way he does this is very interesting where he wants to argue that the act of willing itself, so not merely the will, but the actual willing of the will, is necessary and therefore it has to be identical to God's existence because there can only be one necessary first principle. And therefore, if the willing is last, we're going to have to collapse in the entire argument. We collapse in, rather, the entire series of faculties that flow from that. So I'm just going to go through Scotus's argument first, merely that the first principle's willing is identical to its essence.
So the causality this is quoting directly from SCOTUS here, uh, number 89, if you're following along in the Ordinatio, which I'll link below again. The causality in causing, that is the willing, of the final cause is simply first. For this cause, as concerns its causality, precedes the efficient cause, because it moves the efficient cause to act. Premise two, the causality of the first end is to move the efficient cause as a thing loved. Premise three, it is the same thing for the first end to move the first efficient cause as a thing loved by it, and for the efficient, first efficient cause to love the first end, because for an object to be loved by the will is nothing other than for the will to love the object. For, therefore, that the first efficient cause loves the first end is through and through uncausable. Premise five, so it is necessary of itself. Six, and so it, it's the willing and loving of the first end will be the same as the first nature. First, he wants to show that God's act of willing is simply first, that it logically must precede all other things. And he shows that it precedes the first efficient cause. That's God's, we already showed that that must be first. God's act of bringing all things into being must be first. And it seems that the willing of that, that is the final cause, the purpose for which it's willed, must be first. Um, and he shows that because when something moves towards an end, it does so out of love of the thing. Right, so final causality must precede efficient causality because first there has to be an end for which something is done so that we can act towards that end. And so if the first efficient causality is simply first because it is the cause of things coming into existence, then the final causality, the, thing, the reason for which it is being willed, must be first, must be before that, and so it must also be first. And the efficient causality, that is a relative property that God causes things to come into being. He could choose not to cause it, but the reason for which he does it, that final end, that is necessary because God is ultimate perfection, and so God is that final end no matter what. And it's simply God's choice of whether or not he moves towards that end. And so the final causality of God must be necessary, God's act of willing. And so the will of loving the first end must be necessary. And remember, anything that's necessary has to be the first principle, as we've already established. Therefore, God's act of willing must be identical to uh, the divine essence. And so once we've established that point, it's a little more difficult to establish that willing uh, must be identical to the divine essence. It's very easy to argue to divine simplicity from there that all these other absolute attributes of God are identical to the divine essence. Is if willing is identical to the divine essence and willing requires a will, then willing then the will must be before willing and therefore the will must be identical to the divine essence. And likewise, in order to um, will an end, and Scotus actually specifically says to love the end, he connects the will and love, which is very essential to his theology. Um, this isn't dry academic exercise, but he's already talking about the love of God here. And so in order to um, will the end or to love the end, it must be known. And in order for something to be known, it must be in the intellect. And therefore, willing is posterior to the intellect, or intel the intellect is prior to willing, and therefore the intellect must be identical to the divine essence. And likewise, um, the act of willing must be um, must have specific knowledge in order to be able to will. It's not simply intellect in the abstract, but specific pieces of knowledge that are within the intellect. And therefore, the knowledge, of the, the knowledge of the divine intellect is identical to the divine essence because it must also be prior to willing. And so we've established here divine simplicity, but in a slightly different way than would often be gone about. 
that we've seen essentially gone to the last principle within God, God's willing the existence of the universe, shown that that must be identical to the divine essence. And then from there we can collapse everything else in. But we still kept each of these properties distinct, and this is going to be done through infinity and the modal formal distinction, that these gods willing in his knowing all of these are different operations of the same one divine essence which isn't exhausted by any one finite thing now scotus is going to begin to argue of some of the implications of god's intellect and will and the one he really wants to focus on is divine foreknowledge that we already discussed it a little bit. We discussed the things God knows in order to cause things. But now we want to discuss how God knows these things. And so the first premise he makes is that God knows all possible things, which is his property of omniscience. Scutus doesn't make a direct argument for omniscience within the Ordinatio. But I think if we think about it a little bit, we can reason it to how he gets there, which is that all things are contingent and so that means they could be in other ways they could be in any possible way and the only way god could cause them to be one way rather than another way is that he must know all the possible things he must know them both as they actually are and how they could have been so that he can cause them one way and not the other and so therefore god must know all possible things so Premise two, something existing possibly is not identical to it existing actually. This is quite obvious. Premise three, therefore God knows things existing possibly distinctly from knowing them actually. Right, so if God knows the thing, God doesn't only know all the possible worlds he could create, but he also knows the world that he does create. He knows what he actually wills distinct in his intellect, distinct from what he know what he actually what he could have done. Right? So there's what Scotus is drawing here is a distinction between possible between knowing as possible existence and knowing actual existence. So God knowing everything and God knowing what his will actually does. Hopefully I'm phrasing it in a clear way. I think I think it makes sense though. Um, all right, premise four: before something exists actually, it exists only possibly. This is quite self-evident. Um, as long as we accept the possibility of time, of course, God exists outside of time. So we're talking a little bit analogically here when we say before something exists. But the very concept of foreknowledge itself is uh, somewhat analogical, simply because we're talking about time and God is outside of time. And premise five, therefore God knows things with a distinct and necessary act before they exist. And the reason I quote here with a distinct and necessary act is we've gotten to an important aspect of Scotus, which is the formal distinction that each of these divine ideas are not identical to each other, even if God is simple. We've shown God is simple, but he's also shown here that God's knowledge of things actually existing and God's knowledge of things potentially existing must be distinct. And so he's going to have to come up with a way to fit both these truths in that we can reach both by reason. So when Scotus uh, discusses divine foreknowledge in his arguments, he emphasizes that this is a prelude to his discussion of infinity that follows upon it. And I think that's very important to keep in mind when we're looking at it. And so I want to begin to look at some of the implications of divine foreknowledge and how it's going to relate to his discussion of infinity. The next video in this series on univocity will dive into this in much more depth. Uh, but I want to just do a little bit of a discussion of it to set up some of the later discussions and show you why this is all his arguments here matter because this isn't merely an apologetical proof he's doing, as he mentioned in the lectura quote, which I said in the first one, but that our arguments for the existence of God actually tell us important things about God. And so Scotus has the formal distinction, specifically the modal formal distinction, as a type of formal distinction.
So SCOTUS wants to create a middle ground between a conceptual distinction and a real distinction. So a conceptual distinction is one that exists merely in the mind, while a real distinction is something that exists actually in the thing. And an important qualification to a real distinction that had come about by SCOTUS's time is that it has to have actual separability. So it does seem in St. Thomas that he defines a real distinction as anything that is not the same thing prior to the mind's conception of it, um, even if it's not separable. But by the time of Scotus, it had really meant separability. And so this is what Scotus is saying when he rejects a real distinction. And in Thomas, you have both a weak real distinction and a virtual distinction. A virtual distinction in Thomas is something that only exists with the mind's conception of it, but is saying something real about it. It's not simply saying synonyms like a totally logical distinction would be. So the classic example of this is um, rationality and animality, that humans are rational animals, in that animality here doesn't really exist apart from its existence in a specifically rational animal or in some other type of animal. There's no animality existing on its own. And if their mind never studied it, it really wouldn't exist. It only really exists when the mind begins to think about it, but it's saying something real about it. And Scotus is going to fo fold these two types of distinctions really into one distinction, the formal distinction, which is a space in between a conceptual and real distinction. And I think it's very... That's a very good move on Scotus's part, because I think it can be very hard to distinguish between a weak real distinction and a virtual distinction. And I think focusing on the formalities that are in the thing itself, but not separable from it, are is a good way to go about it. So there is a real identity between the thing and the thing it's formally distinct from, if in the sense that they're all related to the one. Right? So a good example of this is Scotus's discussion of the mind, that intellect is the mind as knowing, and will is the mind as willing. And each of those is simply the will. They're not really distinct from, or each one is the mind. They're not really distinct from the mind. They're not accidents of the mind. They're modes of operation of the mind. And so you want to say it's the same thing with divine foreknowledge, that each idea of God is formally distinct from one another. So they're each identical with the divine essence, but they're not identical with each other. And as we go and explore university, we'll search out how this idea works much more. But I think here you can begin to grasp an idea that each one expresses the one divine essence in a different way. And so each of them is identical with the divine essence. But expresses it in a different way. And each one also does not exhaust the divine essence, as we'll talk about more, because each of these ideas is finite, but God is infinite. And I think this is very similar, actually, to a lot of discussion in Eastern theology. I'm going to talk about this a lot more in the next video, but I just want to point out that I think this is quite similar to the discussion of divine wills you get in St. Dionysius or the Logi in St. Maximus the Confessor, that you have these many ideas that are each related to the one, but don't exhaust the thing fully. And as I said, this is related to this idea of divine infinity and Scotus's discussion of the relationship between analogy and univocity and infinity. So now Scotus is going to go on and talk about divine infinity, which for him is the most important aspect of God. The entire, I think, Franciscan tradition and its way of approaching God can really be characterized by this positive notion of divine infinity, which I'm going to go much more into in depth in the next video. I'm sorry I keep teasing that, uh, but I think I sort of have to lay down these arguments for why we would consider this to be true. And then we can really dive into what do this mean by this when we follow through these arguments fully. And so he lays out four arguments for divine infinity. We first have an argument from efficient causality itself, God's actually causing the world to exist. And this argument also comes in sort of two different forms.
Then he gives a second argument from efficient causality, but here it's really more from the intellect. The possibility of efficient causality itself shows divine infinity. Then third, he's going to argue from final causality that shows that um, God has to be infinite. And then finally, he's going to argue from eminence. In his argument from eminence, he's actually going to resurrect the argument of St. Anselm of Canterbury, the famous ontological argument, as a final capstone within his argument for the existence of God. So his first argument for infinity is an argument from efficient causality, that God could cause an infinite number of different species. We could have God could create any number of possible beings. And this still, though, would be an infinitely number, mathematical number of beings. So we're not saying that he creates an inf another infinity in the sense of God, because an absolute infinity there would be... Um, would just be himself then. We're saying this is a lower type of infinity. It's an inf it's a countable infinity of numbers. Uh, for those of you who know mathematics, this is the idea of the transfinite numbers or the numeric infinity of George Cantor, but not the absolute infinity of George Cantor. As George Cantor himself said that absolute infinity is God. It's a metaphysical infinity that transcends num a numeric infinity. Um, and as we know from mathematics now, you can go on in an in infinite number of mathematical infinities in the ordinals. You can have an infinite number of beings. Uh, you could have omega, then two omega, and so on and so forth. Um, then a infinite motion, though, right, would require an infinite power. And we've already shown in part one that any possible world God could cause, he has to have the power to cause. This is a brilliant move on the part of SCOTUS. And so the possibility of God have in creating an infinite number of species shows that God must have an infinite power, right? Because you have to have an infinite power in order for that to be the necessary grounds for an infinite number of beings. And so God must have an infinite power then, and therefore God must be infinite um, because his power is identical to himself. And so Scotus there theorized that there could theoretically be an infinite number of beings. Of course, he denies that there are an infinite number of beings. He doesn't think that time is eternal like Aristotle does. Um, Bonaventure does have a whole argument against the eternity of the world, but as far as I know, Scotus doesn't present that argument. And here I just want to focus on his argument for the existence of God. And so, Scotus, though, wants to argue there must be something more than merely an infinity of number, though, because God's power isn't a numeric infinity. God's power is an absolute infinity beyond all things. And he actually shows that the movement from non-being to being is infinite, because contradictories have an infinite gap. The space between non-being and some amount of being is infinite, because zero itself, when we talk about the number zero, zero still has being, right? In set theory, zero is the empty set, but it's still a set. And non-being isn't simply the empty set. Non-being is... Um, no existence whatsoever. And so even the empty set has some being in contrast to absolute non-being. And this is go to the point is that there's an infinite gap between that. And this also comes from our definition of being. So St. Bonaventure defines being as that which is in flight from nothing, and therefore God is the purest being uh, which is in full flight from non-being. That being is that which is essentially moving away eternally from non-being. Mm -hmm. And for Scotus, Scot Scot defines it as that which to be is not repugnant. Right? There's really here an apophatic discussion of being that for Bonaventure and Scotus, being is that which is not nothing. And so there's a gap here between um, non-being and being. And so God's movement of all things from non-being into being in the first place is an infinite movement. Even if God only created a single atom, that single atom would take an infinite amount of power to bring about ex nihilo.
And so therefore, God must have an absolute infinity of power, and therefore God must be absolutely infinite. Um, and this is where we're beginning to see here also this idea of the disjunctive transcendentals, where there's an infinite gap between non-being, finite being, and infinite being, and that each of the non, not being some amount of sets and absolute infinity, these are all infinitely far apart from each other. Um, and they're metaphysically infinitely far apart from each other, not merely that we can't count all the way up ever to omega and reach it, but that it's actually in a totally different ontological category. Um, and I'm going to go into that more in my next video, but this is just sort of a prelude to that, since these are the arguments that Scotus uses to set up that discussion. And so... In that first argument from efficient causality, we're really looking at the will, God's act of creating, and arguing that that's infinite, and therefore God must be infinite. And here we're going to focus more specifically in on his intellect and how that relates to efficient causality. So, uh, premise one, God knows all possible things. Premise two, there are infinite possible things. Premise three, therefore God knows an infinite number of things. Premise four, therefore God's intellect must be infinite. Premise 5, God's intellect is identical to his essence, and therefore the conclusion is that God is infinite. Right? Because God knows an infinite number of things, and he doesn't know each of them as though he's being added up, as we've shown God is simple. So he can't be some large numeric infinity, but he must be this absolute infinity, which is simple, but yet contains all things within itself, because it transcends all things. And... The only way all these different number of things can be contained is in the intellect, because the intellect is where the number of things are contained, and specifically in the passive intellect, or what St. Augustine and St. Bonaventure and St. John of the Cross call the memory. Um, and even though Scotus doesn't talk about a distinction between memory and understanding or intellect, when he talks about intellect or understanding, he's taking both of these principles within. And when I do a video on Scotus psychology, I'm going to talk a lot about that. And also as a note on Scotus psychology, since I've been talking about that a bunch here, um, I will have an exclusive interview for Patreon subscribers only um, for $5 a month and up. Uh, with a therapist who's been using SCOTUS within his therapy sessions uh, and focusing on SCOTUS's psychology to actually be able to create positive benefits for Catholic therapy patients. That will be very interesting. Um, and so, yeah, if you're interested in that, it should be up sometime later this month. So I'll go back to the main focus of the video now. And so now he's going to make an argument from final causality, and specifically here really focusing in on the will and its infinity. Because we did have earlier some relationship of the will and the power of God, but here we're really going to focus in specifically on the will, and the will works towards an end, and so that's going to be how he argues here. So premise one, infinite goodness is greater than finite goodness. That's just by the definition of it. Premise two, the will desires what is best. Now, we sometimes make decisions, right, between um, something, we might choose something that's worse rather than what's best. And Scotus does think that there is a free will, that we can choose between multiple goods. And Scotus's point here, though, is within man, there's a distinction between the will of desire and our actual will of decision, like you have in St. Maximus the Confessor, for example, and in St. Maximus the natural will and the gnomic will. But in God, as St. Maximus argued in his disputation with Pyrrhus, there's only one will because God simply wills eternally one single act. And so the will desires what is best, especially the divine will has to only desire what is best. Um, but of course, since God, I just want to explain what's meant by this here, that there is multiple um, contingent universes God could have made that are all equally best. Now, what do I mean by that? That God is, right, infinitely perfect goodness. Nothing can add to him. When you have a numeric infinity, and I'm discussing this a lot because I actually think the modern mathematics of infinity is very useful when it comes to discussing Scotus infinity. And I think that there's a lot of parallels there that really need to be explored. But let's say we take um, number omega. For those who don't know, I've been talking, I've mentioned this a number of times. 
if you walk along your number line, right, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, and let's say we keep walking along it and we go for an infinite amount of time and we finally reach the end of that and we hit omega. Well, then you can have omega plus one, omega plus two. Now, of course, that doesn't actually exist, but it's a useful mathematical construct for us to be able to understand infinity. Um, but God can't then be that omega or the omega plus one or two omega because then you would be able to add something to him. No, God is, if you walk along to omega, two omega, and then you have omega squared, omega cubed, and then omega to the omega, and this could continue on forever. Uh, this is one of the things that Cantor discovered in set theory, is that there is no set that contains all sets. And so there has to be some absolute infinity, which is beyond sets itself, which itself contains all sets within it. Um, and so there can't be anything added to God. When finite things also exist that God creates, they don't add anything to him. Um, God has no real relation to the world. That's what we mean by that, because nothing can be added to God. We don't mean it in some psychological way. Of course, God loves the world. What we're saying is that there's nothing added to God. And so God can desire what is best, um, regardless of whether he is finite or, um, Well, I'm sorry, regardless of, um, he still loves what is infinitely good, regardless of how much things he creates. No, whether he creates some finite things, he creates more finite things, he creates no finite things. In all of those situations, God is still maximally good because he is maximally good within himself. And so if we even look at the human will here, right, the human will desire still what is best in terms of the faculty of desiring within our will, right? Because this is what uh, Scotus is really focusing in on here is not necessarily even the divine will to love what is good, but um, the human will to love what is good. And therefore, the will desires infinite goodness as its ultimate end, right? That in terms of our natural willing within ourselves, we desire that ultimate end. And so does God here. And so the will desires God then as its ultimate end because God is infinite goodness. Um, but there cannot be two ultimate ends, right? The will desires infinite goodness as its ultimate end. And we showed earlier that the will desires God as its ultimate end. And since there cannot be two ultimate ends, these two ultimate ends must be identical. God must be infinite goodness. So I know that's a little confusing the way I phrased it. So let me go back over it again. Infinite goodness is greater than finite goodness. That's obvious. The will desires ultimate goodness, infinite goodness as its ultimate end. And we showed earlier, of course, um, in the very beginning with the relative properties of God, that the will desires God as its ultimate end. And therefore, these two are identical. And even God eternally desires himself, um, his own infinite goodness as his ultimate end. And so... The act of love is how we will towards God. God is infinite love, and we make an act of love the highest of the theological virtues and the perfection of our will. And it's in the will for Scotus that man is perfected, because that's where man makes an act of charity, which is perfect. And we unite ourselves to God by this act of love, or uh, caritas in the Latin, charity. And God himself eternally wills himself, wills towards himself as the end. And so God is infinite love. And so in uniting ourselves to God's infinite act of love in a finite manner, because we can only will finitely, we unite ourselves to God and to God as our ultimate end. And so his final closing argument within this very long argument for God and all the divine attributes is a divine infinity from eminence. And so he's drawing this argument from Anselm, and essentially the argument goes like this. Premise one, it is incompatible with the most eminent thing that something else be more perfect. Premise two, with a finite thing, it is not incompatible that there be something more perfect. Three, therefore God must be infinite perfection. And I'm going to go through Anselm himself in the next video and show that Anselm is arguing a very similar thing. That right in Anselm, the argument's phrased a little bit differently. In Anselm, it's that we're conceiving of this being that than which nothing greater can be. But here he's showing that simply the idea of perfection itself um, 
shows that it must be existing. Um, and here he's not making an argument fully for God. He would have to draw in all those extra premises from Anselm if he was arguing that God must exist. Here he simply wants to put out, though, use the part of the argument for divine infinity. And so that's what he's drawing on here. Um, he also adds the important clarification, though, that without contradiction, that he wants to say as long as we're talking only about what Anselm calls pure perfections. This is, he's drawing this on from Anselm, from the Monologion, something that people don't look as much in Anselm. They often look at the Prosologion and the Cure Deus Homo, but an important work of Anselm is the Monologion, where he discusses the perfections within God. So take, for example, being a good runner. Um, being a good runner, that's a finite perfection because you have to go over a distance, it requires legs, it requires many things that have potential within them. And if one person runs really fast, you can constantly have someone else who runs faster than that person and going on in an infinite series all the way on towards Omega. Um, but we see importantly here that he's adding without contradiction. So for example, goodness. We can have absolute goodness. There can be a highest goodness without contradiction. And so that's a pure perfection that exists within God. Or, or wisdom. Wisdom can exist infinitely. And so wisdom exists infinitely within God as a perfection. But only these pure perfections, not the perfections according to nature. So not a perfection which would be being as good as running as a human can possibly be. That's a perfection according to their nature. But within God, it's not a perfection. It's not a pure perfection that you can always have add another one. This is how he's also drawing this aspect of it from Anselm, because in Anselm's reply to Guanilo, um, he shows Gu that Guanilo's argument of the most perfect island is ridiculous, because the most perfect island is inherently self-contradictory that you can always add another tr palm tree to the island and make it more perfect. And so that is not a pure perfection. We're only saying that God is infinitely perfect in the sense of the pure perfections, because those are the only ones that in an absolute sense can be considered perfections. And he also responds to an argument from St. Thomas that it would make God's existence self-evident, that we would be able to move from the existence of an idea in the mind to its existence in actuality. But in the lecture, uh, he responds to that, where he says, But as for the other objection, where it is argued that according to Anselm, the existence of a thing is self-evident, if it is impossible to think of anything else greater, I reply that such is not the case. Hence, Anselm's intention there is not to show that the existence of God is self-evident, but that it is true. And he makes two syllogisms, of which the first is, something is greater than anything which does not exist, but nothing is greater than the highest, therefore the highest is not non-being. But there is another syllogism, what is not a non-being exists, but the highest is not a non-being, therefore the highest exists. So here Scotus is already moving a little bit to shift Anselm's argument towards the necessary existence of perfection, which I think is what Anselm's really getting at in his argument. But his objection, his response to St. Thomas here is merely that St. Thomas is misrepresenting the argument if he's saying that we now grasp the divine essence. Now, Anselm will say in the uh, Prosologion that we're not grasping the divine essence. The divine essence is still beyond graspability. It's infinite, as Anselm says. And I'm going to go into that more in the next video. But what we are saying here is that it does actually exist. That's all we're saying. It's no more grasping the divine essence than a cosmological argument in any sense, except that it gets a little closer to God's necessity. It's not as though it explains everything about God once we have um, the ontological argument. And this also for Scotus is merely a closing touch on the argument. So Scotus does seem to say that objectively, Anselm's argument is the best argument for God, because it really gets to what God is, that infinite perfection or infinite being must necessarily exist by its own definition that it's incompatible with the concept of being, that it not exist, right? If we think about, for example, the concept of non-being, non-being implies that non-being exists, and therefore something exists now. 
right? There can't be simply non-being. This is what SCOTUS is really trying to grasp at in sort of many different angles. Uh, because we can't fully grasp what being is. Being is just a concept. And so if we look at it from many different angles, we see, oh, infinite being. Infinite being must necessarily exist because to be is repugnant to, to not to be. And it's in full flight from non-being. But on the other hand, if we simply present Anselm's argument in the prosologian to someone, it's not going to convince them, right? We're, it's a very weak argument in the sense that if you ever talk to an atheist about it, they think that's ridiculous. Um, but Bertrand Russell pointed out it's much easier to say that it doesn't work than to say what's wrong with it. And the reason that is, is because it's totally a logical argument. It works validly, but it doesn't seem like it should be right. And so as a result, it's not a useful apologetical tool, but it's a very, very strong theological tool for helping us grasp infinite perfection. And so just like I opened in the first video with reading Scotus's prayer from the De Primo Principio, I want to close with the prayer that Scotus uses to end the entire uh, De Primo, his entire argument for the existence of God. Um, I want to look at how he argues, not how he argues, rather, how he takes all this argument he's had for the existence of God and offers it back up as praise to God to show that God must exist. And so he's, uh, let's pray together this prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O Lord our God, you are one in nature, you are one in number. Truly you have said that besides you there is no God. For though many may be called gods or thought to be gods, you alone are by nature God. You alone are the true God with whom, in whom, and through whom all things are. You are blessed forever, amen. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this here. I hope I did a good job explaining Scotus's argument. And I hope this helped out, gets people interested in Scotism. I know these first two videos could be a little dry at times, because we're just going through very rigorous philosophical argumentation. But I think in the next video, when I step into divine infinity and univocity, and we start seeing how Scotus's system fits together in this beautiful vision of reality, we'll start seeing why this is and as we go on then to discuss his beautiful doctrine of the trinity and the trinity is based on love and then we move on from there to discuss christ in the incarnation as the reason that all things are we're going to start to see this beautiful picture of reality that works out logically both from reason in this argumentation and from revelation as i've been arguing in the biblical videos um and so hopefully you stick with me as we walk through these arguments, and hopefully you're getting something out of these arguments here. I find it myself very useful in prayer to meditate upon divine infinity because it so goes beyond our comprehension of all things. That it goes beyond, even if we can, we can't even conceive of an infinite number of beings, and God is beyond that. If mathematically we grasp the concept of an infinite number of beings. God is beyond that mathematical concept. God goes on beyond anything that can't even be conceived. And so this is just this glorious picture already we have of God. And this is only the beginning of the beautiful theology of Scotus. Um, so if you like this video, please like it, comment below, share it with a friend, uh, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. I release videos every Friday. Um, if you like these videos and you would like to support me, you can subscribe on Patreon. Um, for $5 a month, you um, get access to all videos. You get rather you get access to exclusive interviews for ten dollars a month. You get access to all videos one week early. I already have two interviews planned for the next two months that are going to be really great. So coming up, either shortly before or shortly after this video goes public, there will be an interview with a therapist about how SCOTUS's uh, psychology can actually be applied applied practically to the discipline of therapy. And this therapist has actually used ideas from his research of Blessed John John Scotus uh, to create real positive effects within the lives of many of the faithful in his ministry of Catholic therapy. And then um, the next month, I'm going to be interviewing um, John Fisher 2.0, who has a great channel on 
analytic philosophy in Scotism and how analytic philosophy, um, the objections to Christianity in analytic philosophy can be responded to by a union of Scotism and analytic philosophy and rephrasing uh, the Scotist conception of the Trinity within analytic philosophical terms. Um, because I tend to approach things from a very patristic and scholastic and biblical perspective. Um, besides my discussion of Cantor here, just because I find Cantor fascinating, uh, pretty much there's not a single word in this video that doesn't have some Latin root from, 13, from the 1300s at the latest. Um, and so I think those two interviews will be very interesting. And then also, when you support me by giving money on Patreon, I use that uh, to help create these videos. So I do put a lot of time into creating each of these videos and I'd like to be able to continue. And the only way I can continue is if I get support. Um, right now, you guys are doing great. I've already have quite a number of Patreon subscribers and all of you have been very wonderful. And even if you're not um, subscribed on Patreon. Don't think that I don't care about you as a viewer. Just by watching these videos, you're doing so much. And I, I don't want to put these videos behind a paywall. I'm putting them out there for free because I think this knowledge is important. Knowledge is a common good. And I think hopefully these videos are doing something good for the future of the church. And so I hope you enjoy these and God bless you.